Thank you, Al, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Laura Stroud, and I'm the secretary of the Elgin History Museum Board. One of my responsibilities is to announce the results of the annual board elections. This year, it was accomplished differently. Ballots were, e were emailed to uh, members, and paper ballots were mailed to those members who do not have email access. So the results are as follows. Officers, President Al Walters, starting another two-year term. Vice President Tricia Grosser, beginning a two-year term, and she is a former board director. Returning board directors are Jerry Barnhart, Sandy McClure, and Kristen Sundquist. Two new board directors will be Jim Turner and John Devine. Congratulations to all, and welcome to the new board members. Hello, I'm Jerry Turnquist of the Elgin Area Historical Society. When I look at Old Main, I see one of Elgin's oldest buildings and one rich in history, dating from the 1850s. But I also see a building that's here because of community support. When time began to take its toll on Old Main in the 1970s, the community rallied by launching a program called Buck a Brick to save the exterior of the building. You'll learn a little bit more in just about in a moment in a video that will tell you more about this his the history of this building and what it's meant to the city. I joined the board of the Elgin Air Historical Society in the mid-1980s when we were renovating the interior of the building. So many did so much to make this happen. It was a proud moment when we opened the first floor of, to the public. Previous to that, we'd been meeting at the Gilborn Public Library. Our collection was stored in the library basement and several other locations. Slowly, we brought this museum up to par. We brought the collection here from the library basement. Some asked whether we had enough items to even tell the story of Elgin's history. In the beginning, we had no paid employees. Today, we now have four. We built this museum in one of the finest in the area. We owe so much to many who have made this happen. I've never been ceased amazed of all the talent that, that surrounds me. We also want to thank the city of Elgin for their support putting in more recently of furnaces and tuck pointing the building. If you're one of the many people who've never been inside this building, I encourage you to come and see what we have here. We want to thank you all for participating in the game this evening and thanking you for your support of the society and the museum. Elgin has such a fascinating story and history. Your support will help us do an even better job of telling it. Located on one of the highest points in Elgin, Old Main is the home of the Elgin History Museum. Completed in 1856, Old Main is constructed in the Greek Revival style popular in the United States in the early 18th century. Meant to mimic an ancient Greek temple, the building features symmetrical shapes, columns with a prominent center pediment above, a porch entry with decorative door surround, and dental molding along the roofline. The building is topped with a cupola meant to look like a miniature temple itself. The cream-colored bricks come from a vein of clay that runs from East Dundee all the way into southern Wisconsin. Inside and out, Old Main tells the story of Elgin. Old Main's history begins only a few years after the founding of Elgin in 1835. The foundation of the building was laid in 1848 by the Free Will Baptists with an intent of establishing a college in Elgin. Money soon ran out and it lay unfinished for many years but not before the unfinished foundation was the site of a secret meeting between Dundee Cooper, Alan Pinkerton, and a band of counterfeiters he was seeking to expose. Prominent citizens later pursued the site for a private high school and started building Old Main in 1854. In 1856, the Elgin Academy became the first occupant. In a time when public education did not include high school instruction, Elgin Academy was the first private upper school west of the Allegheny Mountains. It was unique among private schools of the time because it was non-denominational and admitted both young men and women. Old Main originally featured several chimneys necessary to heat the large building. Students came to school with their books and wood to add to the stoves in each room. Water was carried inside from a deep well in the yard, and outdoor privies stood behind the building. 
city water, steam heat, and electricity were added in the 1890s. Inside, the east side of the first floor was used as living quarters for the headmaster and his family. Today, this area houses the Elgin History Museum's pioneer and 19th century exhibits. The west end, divided by a corridor, had rooms students could rent. Today, visitors learn about 20th century Elgin in this space. The second floor of the building housed the entire operations of the school for many years. In time, the second floor would house a gymnasium and auditorium, as well as classrooms and two recitation rooms. On the second floor, the Elgin History Museum created an exhibit and meeting space in what was once the school's library and assembly room. Original metal support columns sit in the center of the room. A stencil design decorates the wall and is a reproduction of the original design found in the room. Today, the third floor houses artifact and archive storage, administrative offices, and a reading room with many books on Elgin history. The third floor of the building was originally left open except for an enclosure around the stairs to the cupola. The large open space could be rented for community meetings approved by the headmaster and the board of directors. In time, the space was converted to classrooms. The current third floor archive storage room was once a chemistry lab and shows evidence of experiments and perhaps careless students on the floor. In the museum's object storage room, original interior windows still remain. These windows previously divided classroom space and now peek out among the shelves of Elgin artifacts. Modern renovations in this area also included access to the large space under the roof and maintenance access to the cupola. The interior of the building has been remodeled and updated to accommodate gallery space, modern bathrooms and HVAC, an elevator, and an emergency staircase. Yet the long hallway and original window openings give a picture of what the building looked like in 1856. Old Main was struck by lightning in 1911, causing the cupola to catch fire and the school bell to fall through the roof, landing on the first floor. The cupola was rebuilt, but Old Main would have a flat roof until its renovation in 1980, when the distinctive gabled roof was replaced and the cupola was raised to its peak, making it visible again from downtown Elgin. The original Elgin Academy bell was moved to a site on the campus. Although the current cupola is fiberglass, it is authentic in style and size and adds a striking focal point to the building. Old Main was occupied by the Elgin Academy until 1969, when financial pressures and needed safety improvements led to its abandonment. The Elgin Academy offered Old Main to the city of Elgin in 1976, and a large-scale fundraising campaign for its preservation began. Old Main drew citywide support as Elgin's bicentennial project. Despite another fire in 1978, the exterior of the building was restored by 1980. Most of the original exterior brickwork was saved. Where bricks were missing or damaged, replacements from a demolished building in Milwaukee built in the 1850s were used. Interior renovations continued, and in 1987 the Elgin History Museum opened. Today, visitors to the museum can view exhibits on Elgin history on the first and second floor, attend lectures in the second floor meeting room, and do research in the third floor reading room. Spurred on by the restoration of the exterior of Old Main in 1980 and the conversion of the John Newman Mansion into Butterman's Restaurant in 1976, the surrounding neighborhood was designated as the Elgin Historic District and placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1983. Old Main stands proud as a symbol of Elgin's past, present, and future. Welcome to the Elgin History Museum, located in Old Main, the first Elgin Academy school building built in 1856. Hey, do you want to play a game? Sure. How about the Did You Know game, like trivia? All right. I'm guessing this will be stuff about Elgin, right? Right. So, did you know that Elgin was founded in 1835? Nope. The earliest settlers of Elgin, the Giffords and the Kimballs, thought this was the perfect spot to establish a town because it was on the route between Chicago and Galena and on the banks of the Fox River. The river provided water power for future mills and factories in a time before electricity. Interesting. I, I didn't know Elgin was that old. Here's another one. Did you know that Elgin was once home to the largest watchmaker in the world? Yes, I did. The Elgin Watch Company, right? That's right. 
The Elgin National Watch Company was built in 1865 and produced more than 50 million watches over its 100-year history. It was Elgin's largest employer with nearly 4,000 on the payroll at its peak. The watches and clocks were sold throughout the U.S. and abroad, which made the name Elgin famous worldwide. There's a wonderful exhibit on the second floor where you can learn a lot more. Great, I'll check it out. The museum also produced a feature-length documentary on the watch company called Circle of Time. DVDs are on sale in the museum store. Okay, here's another one. Did you know that Elgin was once considered the dairy capital of the United States? No, I thought that would be Wisconsin. Nope, it was Elgin. In the mid-1800s, the city of Chicago was growing really fast, and farmers in Elgin got the idea that they could make good money selling milk to people in Chicago. One of the very first railroad lines going west from Chicago ran right through Elgin, so the farmers used the railroad to ship their milk to Chicago. Then, of course, Gail Borden built his condensed milk factory in Elgin, and the dairy business here really took off. It got so busy that the farmers decided to establish their own board of trade, which ultimately became more influential than the dairy boards in Chicago or New York. Really? Yes. The Elgin board essentially set the price for butter and cheese for most of the country for nearly 40 years. The museum has a great display on the first floor. They also produced a documentary on Elgin's dairy industry, along with a traveling exhibit that they bring to schools and libraries as part of their community outreach efforts. Impressive. I I didn't know that the museum produced documentaries. They do. They also produced a documentary on Elgin's African-American heritage. Interesting. The first African Americans to live in Elgin were ex-slaves who were freed during the Civil War. 110 slaves, mostly women and children, came to Elgin from the South on two boxcars in 1862. Although many in Elgin were staunch abolitionists at the time, others in the community were not as welcoming and the ex-slaves were ultimately relegated to live in a three-block area on Elgin's northeast side which became known as the settlement. The museum's documentary, Project 231, tells the whole story. There's an exhibit on the first floor that not only chronicles Elgin's African-American heritage, but also highlights the various immigration patterns that gives Elgin its rich diversity today. Boy, so many interesting things to learn about Elgin. Right? Here's another one. Did you know that Elgin was once home to the most popular road races in the country? There was a racetrack in Elgin? Not an oval racetrack like the Indy 500. It was an open road race. The eight and a half mile route ran over oil soaked dirt and gravel roads that wound through farmland on Elgin's west side. The first race was run in 1910 and the last was in 1933. Some of the top drivers in the world raced in Elgin in front of crowds that topped 50,000. There's an awesome display on the second floor with lots of pictures. All right, I I think I'm done with the trivia game. I want to check this stuff out for myself. Okay, but before you go, I want to mention that the museum does a lot to promote history outside these four walls. They host a cemetery walk at Bluff City Cemetery, an Elgin tradition since 1987, and host a classic car show each July. The museum is working with the city of Elgin to make the oldest cobblestone building in Elgin, the Nancy Kimball House, a community education center. In addition to all that, the museum provides a wide range of programming for children and adults and provides research services for individuals and organizations. That's very impressive. Well, enjoy your visit and make sure to check out our store for books, videos, posters, and a variety of memorabilia. Will do. Thanks. Hi, I'm Liz Marston. I'm the museum director here at the Elgin History Museum. Hi, and I'm Bill Briska, treasurer at the museum. Uh, we're here to show you a few museum accomplishments during this topsy-turvy year of 2020. And, and it has been a topsy-turvy year. We started out really strong with a lot of programs for kids here and uh, some good things going in the museum. And then COVID shut us down, or did it? Not exactly. We actually did some pretty good adjustments and we want to show you some of the things that came out of that little interruption and rebirth. Well, as I said, programming went down, but sometimes it took place in a new format. We did uh, programming for, via Zoom through the museum and through the library in partnership. We recorded videos produced by the museum staff and volunteers, and there are uh, over a dozen on our uh, YouTube channel. 
And we did events outdoors as well as indoors, socially distanced, of course. And we had, uh, once we reopened, we've had a steady little stream of visitors. Let's take a look at the programs we did in partnership with the library, just as a refresher. We had these great two programs, uh, Elgin in the 1950s, thanks to Jerry Turnquist, and Remembering Walton Island, uh, thanks to Al Walters, who put together these um, programs uh, with uh, the information from the collections and, uh, and put it out for people to see. Yeah, we had pretty good turnouts for those programs, didn't we? We sure did. Um, all of these programs have been a much better turnouts than even having them come in person. So here's a program I really enjoyed, put together on Zoom on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, this is a, a performer, Dennis Stromat, who's also a historian in uh, French Illinois history. And so he was um, our Sunday afternoon program, and along with uh, William Hazelgrove, who talked about uh, President Wilson and his wife. And his wife, yes. And we did our brown bag lunches online. This is one of my favorites. Yes, Jane Peterson, um, this is presented by Linda Rock, who did the original research for this. Uh, Jane Peterson was an Elgin artist. Yep, a uh, miniaturist, I think, wasn't she? That's right. And how about this one by Andy Thompson, another one of my favorites? Well, you said you really liked this one. Andy put together a lot of uh, uh, Elgin history about the railroads, and there's a lot of different railroad um, companies that merged together. So, and I think that, that one's been seen over 300 times on our YouTube channel. That's right. And we made some uh, videos uh, for other people and uh, educational reasons. Yeah, this one was a great partnership um, between Side Street Studios and the History Museum, and it was a, a animated shorts of Elgin history, thanks to Rebecca Miller, who put that all together, educator. And she did that so that um, students at home would have some information on local history. Uh, what's this one about? This is our laundry program. We do a, a great, uh, you know, pioneer chores type of program, and it, we couldn't do it in person, but Rebecca and her daughter filmed um, a, a whole uh, video so that the library could show it to children. And these children are doing what? They're um, washing their clothes on the washboard <laughs> in a little pail of water there. A little culture shock for them. Okay, so we had some outdoor events. We gave them a new twist this year. One was the classic car show, which turned into a classic car cruise. How'd that work out? Well, we had over 50 cars uh, parading through the neighborhood, and um, and then they all got awards and went home. Yeah, and did they just kind of take off like that? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what else did we do out in the yard this year? Well, this is another um, partnership with Side Street Studios. We had our Family Fringe Festival here on the lawn. The people were also allowed to come into the museum, socially distanced, of course, but there were lots of great activities for uh, kids, including favorite. Uh, the kid vandalizing that bus. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that's graffiti art. On the side of a bus <laughs> that the uh, side street owns. Yes. Yeah, there's a pretty good crowd for that. Probably over 100 people at various times through the afternoon. Nice afternoon, very nice sunny day. Well, we also got to introduce our cow. That's right. And that's uh, thanks to Dennis uh, McClure who worked with Rebecca to put this cow together, and it is um, very milkable. It's a fully milkable cow. <laughs> so right. kids could get the simulated experience of milking a cow. Yeah, all the fun without the manure. <laughs> <laughs> so the history, I mean, the uh, Bluff City Cemetery Walk uh, took a new turn in its own history, didn't it? Well, we had a, a couple of events that we normally would have, and Bluff City Cemetery is, is an annual walk. Of, I think it's the 34th year this year but we couldn't have it in person, so? Uh, so what we did with the talents of Rudy and Lily and Gelfie is they went out and actually uh, filmed the, the walk. Here's a picture of them in production out there at the cemetery, and uh, we rolled it out on YouTube, and there it's been. Yes, and uh, we had it out for several weeks, and it's um, something that over 2,000 people have viewed and also have given donations for. Yeah, that's a very successful thing. Not exactly the great fun of being in the cemetery on a sunny fall afternoon, but hey, it was a, it was a hit. So, well, not everything's been quiet inside the museum. We still had things going on during uh, shutdown and then right after. Here's an example. 
right? It's our uh, a big exhibit that we opened this year, thanks to Ira Marcus. Uh, he is a volunteer for the museum who um, photographs all of the objects for us. And then we digit those digital images go onto uh, our website so people can have better access. He got the idea of creating um, Photoshopped images that highlight the color and the shape. They go macro and micro. And it really gives you a different perspective on the objects when you compare them right next to each other. Yep, and that exhibits up and still running and will be for a few more months, I think. So here's something new that we started last year, since the last gala, I believe. What's the story here? Uh, we have a great new um, board member, Tina Viglucci, who has um, been able to uh, translate our tours into Spanish. And then she's also helped us get uh, volunteers who speak Spanish. And so now we offer Spanish tours once a month, and it's at 11 and 1 p.m. And people can um, email or call for an appointment, and then we uh, take family groups around. It's been a wonderful experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Sounds like fun. So here's a little oddity. Uh, kind of explain this to me with all these neat little postcards. <laughs> well, these are postcards we've had in the museum store for uh, many years. And we were able to, uh, during our shutdown, when people were staying at home, uh, Rebecca, again, Rebecca Miller, came up with this idea of connecting people in an old-fashioned way, and that's through uh, sending a postcard. So she was also able to kind of activate our uh, volunteer crew, who had been kind of, um, you know, on hiatus for a little bit, by uh, some, some people would take 10 cards, some people took 50 cards, and they would write cheerful messages on the back of them, and then we packaged them up and sent them to nursing homes, um, uh, rehab centers, senior centers, and those were handed out to uh, different people. And then also they gave them blank cards so they could send out to messages to people that they knew. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's a great way to connect people. Uh, speaking of taking things online, let's talk about taking our collection online. Well, we have been digitizing, like I said, with the objects, but also with our photographs. And um, we have our, our curator, Beth, Beth Noara and uh, volunteers like Jackie Marcus and Nora Jimenez have been scanning and digitizing these and then putting them um, up on our website and also on Illinois Digital Archives. And I think you have a few that you like. Yes, uh, I like this one, comes right in there. And uh, I think there's how many? 5,000? Over 5,000 now, right? Here? Wow, that's pretty cool. And you people at home could see them online right there, elginhistory.org or the Illinois Digital Archives. Now, here's something that we came on after COVID, and that is images and stories of our lives, which we're calling You Are Living History. Right, and these are, um, people have been donating pictures, um, objects, archival pieces, signs, um, all different kinds of ways that we can remember our 2020 year. And um, so these are just a few examples of what we've been doing. But we also encourage you to um, go to the website, elginhistory.org, and um, click on the You Are Living History program, and then you can answer questions yourself. You know, what did you do during shutdown? How did you entertain yourself and your family? Uh, what things scared you? What things uh, made you laugh? You know, what things connected mm -hmm. you to, to the community? So COVID quickly morphed unexpectedly into the social justice protests, and uh, we picked up that as well in terms of you are living history. We did. Uh, we had this summer. We had our intern, um, Ms. Khan, did a whole uh, virtual uh, exhibit of the protests and um, the board up art that was done in Elgin. So there you are. If you want to make an entry into it, there's the website address for it. Yeah, I hope you will. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, Old Main is uh, getting a little bit of care from the city of Elgin. This is uh, the tuck pointing that went on this year uh, and painting. You can see the peak of the, the roof there needs a little bit of paint. They also painted the cupola, which needed a special boom. They replaced all of the electric lights and... Um, well, as Al said earlier, the furnace is in air conditioning too. Mm -hmm. Very good. Here's the, here's the action taking place. And what happened here? <laughs> Well, it's your favorite tree. My favorite tree, that 100-year-old Catalpa, took a dive in the uh, windstorm back in July, I think it was. So the city was pretty good about getting that out of there. And we have a donated baby Catalpa that's taken its place. Check back in another 100 years. <laughs> so 
we had a couple other things coming up. Al mentioned some new publications, but one of them is this one that he did not mention. Uh, yes, this is um, uh, something, again, that Rebecca worked on. This is the story of our towns, which was written by um, historian Mike Alft uh, in the 1970s for curriculum use within the school district. And so we're, uh, she really put a new twist on it and updated the language and um, added pictures and worksheets. So it's for second through fourth grade. Yep, it's a pretty cute little book. I've read it myself. And as Elle said, we're trying to bring Elgin Time back into print, and we probably all have it here in the time for the Christmas market. I think we might even have a little pre-sale going at a discounted price. So this stay is, tuned for that. This is a cute little book, too. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and Bill uh, edited, or actually um, wrote, uh, whole new sections of this that relate to the pension fight and? The, the financial unraveling of the company. A little more insight that we've gained since... Mike and I did this book in 2002, I think it was. Yes. So, and across town at our other favorite project, the Nancy Kimball Cobblestone House, things are looking pretty good in 2020. <laughs> There's a, a new door assembly, new lighting fixtures. Go ahead, we have all this. Uh, new window trim. Um, we're putting in the baseboards pretty soon. Uh, door knobs and back door. Uh, Dan Miller did all of this. Thanks to Dan Miller. Thanks to um, Becky Marco for doing all of the painting on here that our, our professional painter didn't do. And um, thanks to Matt Martin, who is uh, our volunteer architect that mm -hmm. helped with the, the front porch. Yes, that's right. So uh, why don't you tell us who else was on the team? Well, we have our, our whole uh, um, museum team that includes uh, George Rowe, Al Walters, Kristen Sundquist, uh, Dennis Roxworthy and Bill and I. That's right. Thanks. Is there anybody else like this? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to say we're really uh, indebted to Dan for the workmanship in terms of designing and building some of these, most of these uh, trim pieces, as well as installing them. So thanks a bunch, Dan. Uh, here's a look inside the building. Yeah, this is the uh, main gallery. Um, one of my favorite rooms now that the floor has been done and it's on a sunny day. It's, it's really rewarding to, to be inside the old Nancy Kimball cobblestone house. And you can even see some of the original architecture here. We've left it, uh, some of the stonework exposed. And you can see all of it on your own if you come by to the cobblestone celebration December 13th from 1 to 3 p.m. It will be, uh, you know, social distance, so we won't be having too many people in the house at one time and uh, face masks will be worn. Great, and I think we're gonna try to live stream it too. That's right, you can catch it on Facebook as well. Okay, well, this is our uh, annual gala, so we're gonna take just a few minutes to say a few things about the museum's finances, which are in pretty good shape. Thanks to you, uh, this, our generous supporters, and the many volunteers that chip in here to provide the labor to keep the place rolling. COVID-19 was a challenge for us, but we responded quickly to it and picked up almost every COVID-19 relief grant that we applied for. And we innovated, as you've seen, with some of our uh, programs and kept on rolling. And things have been, you know, pretty good. We were fleet of foot and very skillful at getting that done. Much thanks to the staff for their ingenuity and talent. And thanks to all the supporters out there. Al, take it over.